I will not comment on anything he just talked about. I was given the job of predicting what politics would be like in 100 years. I had visions of politicians in hover cars teleporting to bean feeds and doing hologram interviews on CNN. Then I thought to myself, politicians in the future could be better people. They could be better versions of ourselves. Maybe they could be cyborgs. But then I realized we've already tried that. <laughs> Didn't work so good. So instead of a political prediction, I come here today with a prescription and a prayer on how to end the gridlock and political brinksmanship we've been subject to. The prevailing wisdom says that bipartisanship will solve our problems. Bipartisanship will break gridlock. Bipartisanship will heal our nations. Well, folks, I'm just not buying it. In fact, today I'll argue that bipartisanship is not the solution. Bipartisanship is the problem. And unless we move beyond bipartisanship, nothing will ever change. Except we'll have jetpacks. I really want a jetpack. So, before I begin my critique of bipartisanship, I need to introduce my fictional friend who will be helping me on the slides. Uh, please say hello, Ted. Very good. Ted, the folks here can't see you, so why don't you give them a picture of what you look like? That is impressive. That's impressive, Ted. Very good. All right, so let's begin. And let's begin with dodgeball. When I was little, I used to play dodgeball in gym class. No, Ted, not that little. I didn't play dodgeball when I was four. Um, all right, regardless, moving on. So in the fifth grade, we used to play dodgeball, and then our gym teacher, Mr. Wick, would let us pick our own teams. Sometimes we picked the kids who were the fastest or the ones with the best throwing arms. It really just depended on our strategy. Okay, now open up your mind and imagine a world in which dodgeball is more popular than all major league sports put together. In this world, there are only two teams, and everyone is a fan or player for one of these teams. Once you choose to become a fan, you are a fan forever, for the rest of your life. It's pretty serious stuff. Now, we're going to call one team my way and the other team highway. <laughs> Each team has their own specific strategy. Team my way always uses a throwing strategy. Team highway always uses a running strategy. I have to agree, team highway doesn't run very well. Um, so, when kids go to school in dodgeball world, they play on school teams that mirror the big teams. And they hang out with their team friends at lunch, at recess, and after school as much as possible. As they grow up, they choose to go to college together. They choose to work together. They choose to attend church together. And they even marry one another, probably before the 28. Everyone in, their, in dodgeball world thinks that their team strategy is the best. In fact, it is the only way to win dodgeball games. Eventually, they pass on their team allegiance to their children, and it all keeps going. But when the games are played, they're a bit dull and usually end in a virtual tie. You see, each team uses essentially the same strategy every game. So the only thing that matters is the individual skill of key players. So unless you have an exceptional player, the games always end the same way. All right, so that's our dodgeball world. It's imaginary. We can all relax because that's just fiction, right? Wrong. Actually, our dodgeball analogy is a pretty accurate picture of American politics today. Over the past two decades, America has been carved up. Those living in the red states, those living in blue states, and those living somewhere in a purple haze. Ah, <laughs> uh, nice one, Ted. I'll give you that one. Experts and pundits call this problem hyperpolarization, with polarization being defined as the division of political opinion between two extremes. Here you can see a theoretical model. Polarization can occur in our national political leaders, our general public, or both. Now, most people think that polarization is only a problem for our national leaders, like real estate prices in Georgetown or office space on K Street. This is a problem of, by, and for the Washington Beltway. Well, a growing body of research disagrees. It should surprise no one that polarization in Congress is at its highest level since we began measuring it. Here you can see that polarization in Congress has doubled since 1997. But it might surprise a few of you that polarization among the general public, that's you, is also at historic levels. Here in this graph we see that people are feeling continually good about their party. 
their own party, but they feel worse and worse about the opposition party. What this tells us is that as the parties have dug into trench warfare, voter allegiance to the parties has actually increased. In fact, we are as politically divided in our everyday life as we are at the ballot box. This divide runs from our grassroots to our grocery stores, Whole Foods or Pomida, Target or Walmart. We eat, live, work, and pray with people of the same red or blue political stripes. In short, we are more politically divided, more party loyal, and more distant from our neighbors than at any other time in the modern era. And the results are painful. Government shutdown, political gridlock, voter alienation, and declining trust in all major institutions, not just government. So what's causing this hyperpolarization? Well, here are the top five things you hear or read when you talk about polarization, with the number one culprit always being the two-party system. But polarization is fundamentally about attitudes, how we think about political issues, not which party we belong to. It may seem hard to believe, but nations with multi-party systems are actually more polarized and more fragmented, even in a calm, neutral place like Switzerland, which has six distinct major parties. Now, however, throughout our American history, our two parties have served to reduce polarization and moderate opinion. Our parties are so large that they must include a variety of differing opinions within their own big tents. This mechanism usually serves to pull the parties to the center. Sadly, as Congress has demonstrated very well, that moderating party mechanism is no longer operating. So where else can we look? Well, to paraphrase President Eisenhower, sometimes you have to make a problem bigger before you can make it smaller. What if bipartisanship itself is the problem? I'm not talking about bipartisanship in the narrow sense. I'm talking about it in the broadest sense. The bipartisan paradigm, the bipartisan worldview, where we divide our society up into two intractable teams, where all problems and all solutions come from two, and only two, dogmatic ideologies. Um, well, yes, Ted, I guess the bipartisan worldview is scary. So making this a speech very timely for Halloween. Sadly, as Congress, or sadly, most of us wear these bipartisan blinders our entire lives. Like a horse's blinders, our view becomes narrowed. Like a horse broken to its blinders, we forget that we're even wearing them. And if we're honest, we get uncomfortable, even scared, when our blinders are pulled back to reveal opposing facts. So, how does the bipartisan world view blind us, you ask? Well, Ted, I'm going to tell them anyway, that's why I'm here. It happens when we accept the three false assumptions of bipartisanship. The first false assumption is the false binary assumption, which tells us that there are only two mutually exclusive ways to view any public issue. We assume the parties must compete and that the competition is zero-sum. If one team wins, the other team must lose. As a result, team or tribal loyalty becomes crucial because helping the other team means your team must lose. The second false assumption is that a party's beliefs or ideology must be unchanging and universal. Unchanging because if a party's belief is true, it must always be true for all time. Universal, because if a belief is true, it must always be true in all situations. For example, if one believes that the free market must work, then one must believe that the free market works all the time in all situations. Or, if one believes that government regulation is a good idea, then one must believe that government regulation is a good idea all the time in all situations. Such universal statements like these should strike us as obviously ridiculous and false. For example, I may agree that a government safety net is useful in many situations, but it can trap some people while saving others. Likewise, the free market is a remarkable engine of innovation, but there is no magic wand in Adam Smith's invisible hand. To believe that any one idea can solve all our problems is childish fantasy thinking. The third false assumption asserts that loyal party people must accept party ideology as dogma. Don't get me wrong, I believe people should stand up for their beliefs. But there is a world of difference between thoughtful principles and unthinking dogma. You see, dogmatic people don't test their solutions with facts and reasons. 
Quite the opposite. They reject any facts that aren't consistent with their own ideology. Instead, they seek to prove their solutions by referring to authority and purity. When they say an idea must work, it doesn't mean it actually has any evidence for it. It just means it's consistent with their own ideology. As a result, dogmatic people will push their agenda long after it's obvious that their ideas don't work. Dogmatic people have an almost irresistible impulse for complete control. They suppress public debate and so inevitably slide toward tyranny. Our history is filled with horrific examples of dogma unleashed. The Inquisition, the witch hunts, slavery, the Holocaust, and on and on and on. In this broader sense, bipartisanship isn't about parties or platforms or politicians. Therefore, we shouldn't tear down the two major parties. We should build them up, make them bigger, broader, and more diverse so they can free themselves from the tyranny of a dogmatic minority. But how? How can we move the parties beyond their bipartisan blinders? What we really need is a new political paradigm, a new way of thinking about public argument and public problem solving. So I suggest reclaiming two grand American traditions. We need a new political pragmatism, and we need to revive our living democracy. As a process, our new political pragmatism is focused on practical public problem solving. All right. Ted's finally catching on to the alliteration in this speech. Let me see if I can do this. Political pragmatism and practical public problem solving. Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled peppers. Boom. Got it. Take that, Ted. But now we have to get back to work. Drawing on pragmatism's roots, we carefully define the problem and judge definitions by their practical effects, not the dictates of an artificial dogma. Next, we test solutions in the marketplace of ideas through rigorous public debate, which includes all sides, not just two. Finally, we design solutions with observable results, proven by data, and tested by experience. If one solution doesn't work, we design another. Those who refuse to change their minds in the face of overwhelming evidence are trapped by dogma. We shouldn't vote for them, and we shouldn't allow such extremists to continue hijacking our political process. All right, I guess I'm getting a little serious. So we're going to return to dodgeball. This season, our, our dodgeball teams are plagued by serious injuries. Team My Way, the throwing team, thinks there's something wrong with the dodgeballs, that they're not inflated or they're too heavy. Team Highway, the running team, thinks there's something wrong with the surfaces, that they're uneven or that they're slippery. The league gets together a blue ribbon panel of experts to study this problem. The panel comes back with a radical conclusion. There's nothing wrong with the dodgeballs. There's nothing wrong with the surfaces. It's each individual team's style of play. That's why the throwing team has serious arm injuries and the running team has serious leg injuries. But of course, both teams reject the panel's findings and lobby into a virtual stalemate for years. No serious reform ever passes. Sound familiar? Well, it should. Because it's uh, an LG4, well, yeah, I guess it could be the Hatfields and McCoys. I suppose it could be American Idol versus X. No, no, no. It's definitely not about that. Ted is from California, so you have to let him go. <clears throat> Although our dogmatic dodgeball drama could represent any of these historic feuds, what I was actually talking about was, yes, thank you, Ted, the congressional debt and budget struggle. After 20 years of budget gridlock, we have to ask ourselves, what will it take? What will it take to break this cycle? I believe the solution is in our hands. Congressional gridlock will end only when you and I and voters all across the country start to listen to each other again and stop rewarding politicians who fuel the feud. Now, I'll admit, it might be fun to talk trash about the other party or vote for people whose extremism is entertaining and cathartic. But let's be honest with ourselves. If we vote for people who fuel the feud or give them money, we are part of the problem. The problem starts and ends here with us. And it's really not that hard. Once we remove our bipartisan blinders, it's obvious that good solutions can come from the left, the right, or anywhere. National solutions might even come from local city governments, maybe even Lakeville. This is where being mayor comes in. As mayor, I don't have the luxury of bipartisan blinders or dogmatic devotion to ideas that don't work. Potholes must be filled, streets must be safe, and if we can't pass a budget, we don't deserve to get reelected. 
Mayors and city councilors can't get away with gridlock. At City Hall, everyone is a pragmatist. And in America, we need our voters to be pragmatists too. Real democracy doesn't dwell in marble buildings or wear party colors. Real American democracy is lived every day in millions of small ways by its people. But it's not enough for voters to sit on the sidelines. So I have three final suggestions for reclaiming our living democracy. First, we must allow ourselves and our national political leaders to change our minds. In a recent TEDx talk, political theorist Yvonne Krostev said that a democracy is essentially about people changing their minds based on rational argument. Certainly, politicians who pander to the prevailing polls deserve to be attacked. But we should applaud people who change their minds after long, careful thought with better information. We can't have a living democracy if we aren't willing to change our minds once in a while. Second, we must allow our leaders to make temporary effective alliances. If your current allies won't vote for the best solution, then you need to seek new allies. It's not a mark of traitorous disloyalty to disagree with your friends from time to time. Finally, we need to relearn the lost art of democratic discourse. Civil argument is a good start, but it's not enough. After all, if someone tells you very, very politely that they will never, ever listen to you, then you're probably not on the verge of a nonpartisan breakthrough. Only substantive public debate based on quality evidence and sound reasons can keep our democracy healthy and robust. This doesn't mean you have to run for office and you definitely shouldn't run against me. This doesn't mean you have to volunteer for a zoning commission. This doesn't even mean you have to go to a zoning commission meeting, and you shouldn't. But this does mean we must be willing to engage our friends and family and neighbors in constructive arguments. This Thanksgiving, I want us all to ignore the old cliche that we shouldn't talk politics, and instead, enter into some good old-fashioned American arguments. Not shouting, not being rude, not just contradicting, but genuinely constructive arguments. Such arguments require us to be humble. Believe me, being humble is not my greatest strength. But without some humility, an argument is just a fight. Being genuinely humble requires us to consider the possibility that we might, just maybe, be wrong. Reclaiming our democracy like reclaiming our parties cannot and should not be done by our national political elite. If America's citizens don't live our democratic principles, we can't expect our political leaders to save us. But together, we can create a worldview which is nonpartisan, not bipartisan, driven by data, not dogma, and focused on problem solving, not polarization. Who knows? We might even tear off those bipartisan blinders and discover a new way to balance the federal budget, reduce poverty, or maybe a whole new way to play dodgeball together. Thank you. <laughs>